On the way back to Narrow's Gate, the car rattled on the plank road. Benno was thinking, okay, Silvio Garza has the neighborhood back in shape with that cue ball headed bone skulking around and everybody cooperative. His aunt and uncle were doing good business. He did right by Nina. Leo was set. The loose ends were tying tight. He was ripe for a fresh start. But as a big steam engine belched and wheezed in the adjacent Lackawanna yard, Benno realized that for the first time in his life, he was thinking, what's going to happen to me? Not when his mother died, not when he lost his eye, and not when he walked up the tenement stairs to kill Frankie Fortune and Boo did he ask that question. When he searched his brain for his next move, he found nothing. Hey, I'm Jim Fusilli. I am the author of the Audible original Narrow's Gate and the Mayor of Polk Street. And I'm Eduardo Ballerini. I'm the narrator of the Audible Originals, Narrow's Gate and Mayor of Polk Street. So I took a map of Hoboken. You know, where I, I, I lived the first 27 years of my life in Hoboken, but I, I wanted to fictionalize it. Right. So I took a map and I took a whiteout and I whited out the names of the streets. Right. And I wrote the names of new streets. Nice. But in order to remember them, so I wouldn't confuse them with the old streets. I put them presidents in alphabetical order. All right. But, it, you know, you get to W really fast with <laughs> presidents, you know, yeah. so. Wilson, I think. You're, you're all you're of a run sudden, out, you're, right? you run out of presidents. And that's how Polk Street came to be. I was gonna ask you about that, actually. You know, that's right? how the mayor of Polk Street, the, our audi audible original, right. came to be because I named the streets after presidents. So when you were renaming the streets, were you also from memory renaming like the stores that, that, that show up in the books or the families? Because there's, a, there's a, you know, certain different families that show up. Yeah, with the are these from your, your experiences? With the exception of the characters that are based on real life people. Like right. In, in Narrow's Gate, which right. is also an Audible original, yeah. um, you have the character of Sin like Sinatra right. and like Ava Gardner, right. and, um, you know, like Artie Shaw and people right. like that. But uh, and in in the Mayor of Polk Street, you have a character who is clearly influenced, shall we say, by Jerry Lewis. Sure, we were we were wondering about that as we recorded. I was like, okay, so so what Jim is doing here is he's taking these real life characters, Sinatra, Lewis. And he's creating these other characters out of them, which we very much enjoyed, like playing this game sometimes, of like trying to figure out who was who. You know, as, as covering the entertainment business as I had for so many years, it was relatively easy to write the stage patter for the singer mm -hmm. and to write the recording sessions for the musicians. Mm -hmm. But it was less easy to write the skits for Joey Aaron, okay. the comedian. Right. Okay. What I wanted to ask you is how do you approach that? That part of the book is so wildly different in tone. Right. Do you have to do you have to embody that character? You're writing this fine line all the time with when it comes to audio because you're presenting a book and you want it to come alive and you want people to hear it and you also want people to see it. But you know obviously that you have a certain restriction you're just in audio, right? So what I try to do and especially in this case is simply follow what you've done. Right, what you're giving me is going to be my guide. So the Joey Aaron sequences, which I loved, like I mean, they're they're brilliant sequences where he's he's jumping off a stage, he's he's throwing shrimp, it's landing on his head, he's going up, he's playing a Rachmaninoff piece, it's all there on the page, right? And so we were trying to also figure out his voice, right? Because he has he comes on with this this brilliant sort of squeal and shriek every time and I was thinking okay it's Jerry Lewis and we worked on that for a while actually to get that really? right really? we did because we wanted it to be right we, we didn't want it to sound so over the top that it was kind of annoying although Jerry Lewis can sometimes ride that line and so my job was to simply present what you've what you've written one thing I like about the audible originals and uh, from an author's point of view is you know, when we turn our book over to a reader uh, it ceases to be our book. It then becomes the reader's book, mm -hmm. and the reader has input in the book. Mm -hmm. What I find interesting about narrators is whether you intend to or not, you are interpreting the book in, sure. in, in subtle ways. And what I like about your work very much is I, I get a sense of you, but it's not overwhelming. It's very respectful to the work 
And um, is that a conscious thing? Do you think about it in advance or does it just happen? I, I, as a narrator, always feel like I'm first and foremost in service to the writer and the book. That it is not necessarily my place to present me. It's not, it's not my show, right? It's your book. It's Polk Street. It's Narrow's Gate. That's what's important. So it is a kind of fine line because you want people to notice a performance and say, what a great performance and appreciate it. But you also want to step back and allow the world to just present itself. I want people focused on the story. I want people focused on the characters. If they can also appreciate, hey, that guy's doing a great job, fantastic. But I don't want that to be the first thing that's happening. Yeah, yeah. You know, people describe me as gangster stories, mm -hmm. entertainment stories, uh, historical fiction. Mm -hmm. uh, to me, it's, it's uh, the Italian-American experience mm -hmm. and trying to become uh, part of the culture and trying to find purchase within, within the culture. Mm -hmm. um, did, did you identify with that as, as an Italian-American? My Italian-American story is slightly different in that my father is an Italian from Italy and uh, my mother is an American and I grew up between the two. It's certainly a world I know uh, by virtue of being Italian and American. But when you're talking about your books, I don't think of them as gangster books. I think that's a very narrow way to look at it. I think, and I, obviously we've talked about this, they're books about characters. And so when you're talking about Benno, when you're talking about Bibi, you're talking about their struggles. You're t they could be anybody. In a sense, like the ethnicity and the nationality doesn't matter. And that's what I connected to. So the Italian aspect of it, to me, was, was less important than what was going on in the emotional lives of the characters. I think I'm glad to hear you say that, because I, I do think when, when you listen to uh, Narrow's Gate or The Mayor of Polk Street, you can easily imagine the books being set in you know, 2010 sure. with another ethnic group going through the same experience. Sure. Well, it's a constant process that we're, con that we're revisiting all the time, especially in this country. But we often do forget that these, you know, these, these groups of immigrants, uh, even 80 years ago now, um, were this first wave. But it's interesting to see this in your books about how they are experiencing this. They're kind of still in this new land. There's a scene in uh, The Mayor of Polk Street in which Benno is in a pizza parlor mm -hmm. that he's been, you might remember this, uh, although you've just read, what, <laughs> a thousand pages of uh, <laughs> these two books. But um, Benno is in a pizza parlor that he's been going to since he's a little kid. Mm -hmm. And they know him, you know, he just sets up in a booth and he opens the newspaper and he sits and, and he resents the fact that everybody else in the pizza parlor is Irish. Right. You know, and he actually makes a crack, something like, I think that guy wants it with mayonnaise. Right. Or that guy's eating it with a knife and fork. Right. And he really, you know, so you know, he wants purchase, mm -hmm. as does Bibi and as mm -hmm. Leo Bell, the, mm -hmm. the Benno's best friend. Right. But not so much come to us. You right. know, we have our thing. And, right. But then you have, sorry to interrupt you, no, but no, then no, you no, also please. have the great story between Leo Bell and Imogene, right, where their cultures are are clashing. So Imogene the, from the Irish family becomes Leo Bell's uh, fiance, and then the mother's reaction that she doesn't possibly want because he's his Jewish heritage. Right. So you have all these, these lines coming together. So there's something very modern about this book, even though it's set 75 years ago, that what we're looking at is still happening today, which is why I think the books work, quite frankly, because what you're hanging on to is the character's experience, which can speak to a modern experience. Right. What I always say is that as an actor, you have to find something that you like in any character. You take the, the most horrific person that ever walked the planet. If you're going to play this person on screen, on stage, in audio, whatever, there has to be something about them that you, you like and respect. So with a character like Mary, it's interesting. You can kind of respect the fact that she loves her daughter and she actually wants what she thinks is best for her. Right? Right. We may think it's misguided. But you understand where she's coming from. Right. You know, she is protective of her daughter. She wants to have you know, the, the best for her. She doesn't think this is it, however misguided that is. Right. So that's the thing that you, you like about her. Right. What I wanted to also ask you about is the character of Fat Tootie. Mm -hmm. um, because I think he undergoes not just a physical metamorphosis, mm -hmm. but he, he changes. I mean, he remains a killer. Right. But he suddenly has a different form of self-regard. Right. How do, you, how do you play that? Or, you know. Fat Tootie, who is a hitman, who gets 
shot in the legs, ends up in the hospital, and sheds about a hundred pounds while he's there. So he's no longer Fat Tootie. Now he's sort of slender, suave, Johnny Razor, he calls himself, <laughs> which is a great name. So what I thought was interesting about him, you always want to see a character arc in somebody. You want to see somebody go from point A to point B. And even in, in a, a secondary character like Fat Tootie, he's not one of the leads of the books, but I thought he had this brilliant arc where he wanted to go from one thing and become the other. And what I thought was great is that he too somehow gets swept up in this mid 20th century drive to reinvent and become glamorous right. somehow. And he kind of almost like leads us into an era where, you know, the hitman, the mafioso took on a kind of like glamorous aspect. But I wanted to ask you something. So we're talking about the Audible Originals, Narrow's Gate, Mayor of Polk Street. And we have these these worlds that we're living in. We're living in New Jersey, in Narrow's Gate, which is Hoboken, which is your town. Have you met Frank Sinatra? I have never met Frank Sinatra. Okay. I met his mom. Okay. Um, who was a very imposing figure. When I wrote the character of B.B. Marcella, it was not based on the Sinatra that um, I knew of. Okay. I knew lots of people who grew up with Sinatra. I, I based the character on what he would have been like mm -hmm. if he was the way the public perceived him to be. Interesting. As opposed to a very hardworking artist. Right. Someone who is both driven but focused. Right. Uh, compassionate in his own way, mm -hmm. but desperately insecure. Right. Um, so that was, the, that was the way to... to right. Go about that. Because B.B. Marsala, who's one of the central figures of Narrow's Gate, um, does have this, you know, unquenchable thirst for love and affection, and he's looking for it everywhere. Because like a wrecking ball, every scene that he comes into, he knocks people down, and they're all trying to like put the walls back up right, around him. Right, yeah. There's a lot of money involved, you know, there's a lot of glamour, there's all, he's got the starlets and the robes in his hotel rooms, everybody wants to get into the room. Once you get in the room, you realize that he's destroying everything. It's, it's a, it's a, I really liked him, he was one of my favorites. Yeah. Now, in terms of the mayor of Polk Street, right. um, the, the title for the, this audio, Audible original is, uh, who is going to become the mayor of Polk Street? Right. You go in assuming that it will be Benno. Well, Benno, the central character, I think we can say for both books, is dubbed the mayor, mayor of, Polk of Polk Street by the others. Right. right. He's, his, grocery, his family's grocery store is right. on Polk Street, right. and he walks up and down right. the, the streets, and people acknowledge him. And he earns this almost by, by attrition, because he's the last one standing. He's the and last one standing. You know what I mean? It's like everybody else is left. He's the one who knows the history and knows where all the bodies are buried, right. and so he becomes the mayor of Polk Street. And yet here comes a new right. crew that plays by different rules. Right. And I, I'd like to think that three quarters of the way through the book, we don't know if who the mayor of Polk Street actually right. will be. Right. What I found interesting about Benno, though, is also that there's a kind of hum humility to him. He's, he's not as ambitious, let's say, as his best friend Leo Bell or as his old friend Bibi Marsala. And he's almost, there's a part of him that's almost embarrassed to be who he is. How did you like it when Sammy Davis Jr. showed up in, in The Mayor of Polk Street? That was a surprise <laughs> because he was mentioned a couple of times earlier, right? And so there was this sort of buildup of like, is this character going to show up? And it was one of the rare instances where uh, a, an actual celebrity actually makes a kind of cameo yeah. in there. But, you know, how can you leave out Sammy Davis Jr. if you're going to talk about this world? And, and he's the perfect amalgam of all these things, right? right you right. know. But a question I have for you is, so we're living in this, this Italian-American world, and obviously there are these gangster mafia elements that come in, play a big part in these books. Was this something you grew up with? I did, I did. Uh, I was almost fresh out of high school, I became a teamster mm -hmm. in, a, in a local that was eventually seized by the Justice Department. Wow. And there were some, some, some bad guys associated right. with, with it, and I don't mean you know, they double parked. <laughs> I mean, you know, they were murderers and right. extortionists and, right. and very bad people. And I, I actually met some of them and knew some of them. And, yeah. and um, it was very bizarre because I wasn't interested at all and mm -hmm. they knew it. You know, I had In my, their world. Yeah, I right. had my eye on, on something else. You but know? they provide essentially the backdrop yeah. for these 
two Audible originals sure. that you've written. Yeah, so yeah. how did that come to be? Well, um, so what I wanted to do when I wrote Narrow's Gate, I had the basic idea of Benno and Bell um, living much smaller lives than B.B. Marcella. How could I tell the story of getting out of Narrow's Gate? Mm -hmm. I decided to use the gangster right. angle. Things that Puzo used mm -hmm. are, are in those books. And I just said, okay, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put good people in, in contact with very bad people mm -hmm. and try to see what happens. Okay. What, will the, what would the result be? Right. Uh, and I hope that comes across. I hope, I hope people understand that uh, there's no, this is not an endorsement of that no, lifestyle. No, it's, it's a historical reality that can't be denied, right? There were Italians, they created this mafia, they ran these towns like Hoboken and the, the docks and all of these places. Um, then there were others who had nothing to do with it or wanted to get out of it, like, you know, Benno, uh, Bell, certainly, Marsala, to a degree. They want nothing to do with the, the mob life. But we can't deny that it wasn't around them. Right. Right. So it has to exist. In writing about it, uh, it there was the stimulation that, uh, the, the remembrance, mm -hmm. the memory was stimulated, that, boy, I was butted right up against it. Yeah, and know? these characters are too. I mean, Benno and Bell, they can't, get away from them. They're in the Salomeria, they're walking down the street, they're, you know, they're collecting. So it provides this, this you know, the, the backdrop for their world and they have to handle it. And I think in, in both Narrow's Gate and the mayor of Polk Street, we see people being handed opportunity all the time. And they either maximize it or they completely botch it and their lives become right. worse than they were. Right. Um, They're very human stories, as I said earlier, that, you know, one of the greatest things is when a person's story, which is so specific, right, it's their house, it's their street, it's their, but it somehow feels like something that you've gone through. That's what makes a story accessible. And so all of these characters, um, you know, they, they, they speak to us very personally. Yeah. I'm glad to hear you say that. You've said nice things about our uh, Audible original, I thank you. For, for that, and I thought we were, that yeah. you were going to be just right for Mayor of Polk Street and Farrow's Gate. Thank you. With all those characters. With all those characters. <laughs>